I'm, uh, I'm going to be talking about graphing here um, with Angular, SVG, and D3. Um, here's me, my info. Um, I'm not actually really very active on like Twitter or like socially on GitHub, but you know, you can. That's that's where I am on this. Thing. <laughs> uh, if you're. Um, cool. So actually. Uh, I don't know why I put this slide in, but actually, I just wanted to ask people if they're actually, are people actually familiar with SVG and, uh, yeah, kind of, show of hands, SVG, kind of, D3, people, cool, awesome. Um, cool, because we're going to get into some, some details there. Um, cool, so SVG, uh, I'm going to sort of fly through some of this stuff because my talk was running long even in a uh, little practice earlier today. Um, so going to try to just uh, speed through. Uh, we can talk about stuff later if people have questions. Um, so SVG, uh, great things about it. It's DOM, right? So um, as opposed to Canvas, you draw things, and they're actually still things in the DOM, right? Canvas, you draw things, and they're just like in a grid of pixels, and you can't change colors. You can't do anything without redrawing into the Canvas, right? Um, so with DOM stuff, you can select and uh, modify different pieces of it. Um, their elements, they have a lot of the same sort of uh, scriptable properties and stylable properties as HTML elements. Um, they can capture events, so you can attach mouse handlers onto specific shapes in your SVG. Um, you can style them with CSS, I think I mentioned already. Um, so you can change colors, you can actually have a designer actually work on stuff instead of writing code to change colors. Um, so here's just a little example of that, this is kind of a stupid example. <laughs> um, Here's a piece of a chart. Uh, it has a line in it. So we have the stroke color there. Designer can come through, change the color, and it actually changes in the thing. So yay. Um, cool, you can also change things. You can change fonts of uh, SVG text elements. Um, you can change opacity. You can use things like hover states to change things when the mouse goes over. You can use CSS transitions to move things around. Um, so it's very familiar to people that uh, develop with HTML, as front-end developers do. Um, so I'm not really going to compare it too much to Canvas, which is what we were using before, uh, because I think, I think we mostly know what the uh, advantages are, especially resolution independence, which is really cool. Infinite zoom, you can print it, and it looks amazing at a poster size. Um, very cool. Um, you can also export. So they're actually just standalone SVG files. You can grab stuff from the inspector in Chrome and, like, copy as HTML, paste it into a file, and that's like an image file, which is very cool. Um, cool, so next up, I'm just gonna talk briefly about D3. Uh, most people know what D3 is. It uh, stands for Data Driven Documents. Um, so it's a very popular framework right now for visualizations, uh, DOM manipulation, in uh, particular uh, SVG manipulation. Um, so here are some pros. Um, so it was created by some really, really smart guys with PhDs, uh, like Stanford's Visualization Lab, um, and then at the New York Times. Um, so uh, it has a very solid backbone. You know, it's not some cruddy piece of code. Um, it knows how to do things with SVG, um, which is really cool, because you probably know how to do things with SVG, too. It's just like HTML or whatever, right? You can write it by hand, which is really cool. But you know, certain parts of it, uh, you probably don't want to write by hand. like. Here's a line, right, that has uh, a D attribute that's just that, right? <laughs> <Like>, what? <laughs> um, so it also, uh, D3 also knows how to do other things with SVG that are really cool, right? It can, it can draw axes out of like multiple SVG components and pick nice values to tick things off at. Um, it can animate things around. Um, it has like nonlinear scaling functions for your logarithmic graphs and stuff. It has pluggable layouts that are really awesome. Um, if you've seen some demos of like force directed layouts where you grab nodes and move them and everything else like gets dragged around with it and reconfigures. Very cool stuff. Um, it's extremely modular and flexible. Um, so it's broken down into really small pieces that you can use just by themselves without using the rest of the framework, which is really cool. Uh, the API is like really well done. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of the functions take uh, optional other functions that you can pass to them to sort of reconfigure how it's going to access your data or do things like that, um, which is really cool. 
Um, there's also a super active community with lots of impressive examples. If you've visited the homepage, you've seen that. Um, if you haven't, you should definitely check out uh, the homepage, which I think is d3js.org. I don't know. Uh, you'll find it. Um, yeah, super cool examples. You've probably, if you ever look at Hacker News or something, you've probably seen cool examples linked to. Uh, there was like an awesome Obama's 2012 budget thing that was in New York Times. Well, New York Times uses it all the time. Um, that was just super awesome with like little bubbles floating around showing size of different uh, federal budget allocations and you could click and sort of reorganize them in different ways. Um, very cool. Budgets, really cool. Um, <laughs> so some cons of D3, right? So it's not, it's not, everything is not great. Um, it's extremely modular and flexible. Um, so it's, it has this like sprawling API that is pretty intimidating at first. Um, it was created by really, really smart guys with PhDs. <laughs> so again, like the API is like, you know, you can go through several tutorials and still kind of not really understand what you're doing, um, which, yeah, does happen. Um, and it's just, it's kind of hard to do simple things, right? So you have all these components, like I mentioned, axes and scales, and, you know, can draw that line path and stuff. Um, but there's no, like, line graph component, right? Um, I'm sure someone's written one, but... Um, like D3 itself is, is pretty low level stuff. So to do anything uh, substantial with it, you kind of have to do a lot of boilerplate. So um, when we were moving to Angular, I'd already been messing around with D3 a little bit in our old closure code base and it sort of you know, come up with some ideas for things. You know, we, we kind of know at this point in, our, in the life of the company, we're five years old, that like, you know, we do certain things all the time. We do bar graphs, we do line graphs a lot, right? Um, so I knew we, we sort of needed something that was going to be reused a lot. Um, this is something that definitely it's worth it. Um, so uh, we took Chartbeat plus Angular plus D3 and created a library called C3. <laughs> <laughs> so I had some uh, design goals in mind. So first, uh, we wanted to handle the common cases, like I just mentioned, right? Like line charts, bar charts, that sort of stuff. We wanted to handle those with a lot of ease, right? We, we do those all the time. So not much boilerplate. We wanted to really lower the learning curve so that you know, there didn't have to be like a couple experts at the company that knew how to use this thing. Um, and that you know, it would be really easy for people to just quickly prototype things, right? Because uh, lots of times our designs are, I mean, our designs are in flux, right? They sort of uh, gradually develop as we're developing products. Um, so you don't want to have to spend forever making some sort of graph just to see, like, once you've got some client data into that thing uh, in a final design that, like, it's on every client you look for, like, the line is just like a flat line that doesn't tell them anything, right? Um, so we use this for prototyping all the time. Um, so we wanted to allow for designers to style, which is pretty trivial when you're using SVG, um, you know, with some sort of smart attachment of classes on things or whatever. Um, it makes it makes it pretty good. Um, um, so uh, we wanted to follow Angular idioms. Um, and in particular, uh, that means that we want to be able to declaratively create these graphs um, using templates, right? Um, so if you want to add a line and another line and an axis that shows dates or something, like these things can all be in your template, right? They're, they're sort of visual things. It makes it easier for the designers to go into the actual template files and see like how the graph is constructed, um, so they can do styles and stuff. Um, we wanted to use Angular data binding, right? This is one of the killer features of Angular, right? Is you create these templates, you put in your little uh, double curly bracket things, it interpolates values. Um, you give certain directives like expressions, and those just get evaluated all the time, and it figures it out and draws things. So we want that to happen. Um, and ideally, we wanted it to play well with existing directives. So things like ng show, ng repeat, ng click, we want those to just sort of work on the graphs. And finally, um, we wanted to allow for composability. So, you know, we don't just want to create, and this sort of goes into what we were talking about, about, about the reusable components and sort of breaking things down into smaller pieces, is we don't want to just create like a line graph component that then you have to add like a million attributes to that thing to tell it what to do. We wanted to sort of build smaller pieces and then allow us to compose them uh, within the templates. So, um, so we have these technologies. We have Angular, we have D3, we have SVG. Um, how do we actually get them to all work together? What's the best approach? 
So uh, the sort of most obvious thing, if you're coming from Angular, might first you might first think, let's take an Angular-centric approach. Um, I'll just put SVG in my template, right? I can just create an SVG um, and put it right in my template, and it'll appear on the page, no problem. Um, I can use D3 in my controller um, to take the data from my model, so my domain data, I mean, you know, my client data or business data or whatever, and transform it into a presentation model. So I can run it through D3's line functions to actually produce that gigantic string that actually told that line what to draw, right? So I can just do that on my controller and then put that sort of presentation model, that string, on my scope and let the template render it into the SVG. Um, so that's exactly what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> um, so does this actually work? Um, so here, here's a simple example. Um, here I've defined a controller. Um, I just called my little code test place a playground. Um, so we've got playground control here that has a model with just uh, an array of a few, a few numbers on here. And then here in my template, um, I'm using that controller here, right? So that stuff is set up on the scope within here. Um, for, I create an SVG. Um, and then in here, I'm repeating both of these things, right? So I'm ng repeating this SVG circle for each item in this test array. Um, and I'm using ng attribute if you're not familiar. It's like ng href. Um, it basically, it, if you just try to assign this to CX, it, it will throw an error because that value is not valid until actually Angular puts an actual number in there, right? And SVG will complain that that's wrong. Um, so basically, we're, we're templating in uh, the value that we're repeating on, right? So this is going to repeat uh, same thing with the rectangle. So then high five, that actually worked, right? So our ng repeats worked, everything works fine. We've got circles, we've got rectangles, squares. Um, so we're going to reuse this all the time in our products, I predict, right? This, the designers are crazy for circle squares. So <laughs> I'm creating a directive, right? Um, so I'm going to encapsulate this template that I just used in here, right? Uh, like, why do I need to ng repeat both of those things when I could create one directive and then just ng repeat that thing and it's all encapsulated, right? So I create a custom, uh, x doesn't really work as like a attribute thing that you can set because Angular will pull the x out if you know how it changes the names of attributes. Um, so I'm, I'm going to call the attribute that they have to set on the directive cdx. Um, and we'll bind that to our isolate scope at x. And then each of these things uses that x to draw, right? Uh, where's my mouse? Any mouse? Then in the template, instead of having the actual SVG stuff in here now, now I just have my directive. I'm repeating that. Um, I've bound this thing to that CDX so that gets bound to X within the directive and it should all draw fine. Okay, so, so this is actually what we get. Um, <laughs> nothing, nothing happens. Um, <laughs> and if you actually, if you look in the DOM, you'll kind of see everything there and it looks like it should work, right? The SVG is here, here's your thing, here's the circle <laughs> on the rect. Um, but this actually doesn't work uh, because this thing is not an SVG thing, right? Like you created this thing in HTML5, it's fine to have these unknown elements that have a name that the, the parser doesn't understand really. But for SVG, it doesn't, right? So it, it has no idea what to do with this. So this, even though your circle and rect like, look like valid SVG and everything, uh, that's just not actually gonna work. Um, so let's try this again. Instead of having a directive element, we'll have the directive be an attribute, right? Um, so everything else is the same here. Um, it's just gonna be a little bit different the way that we use this directive. Um, yeah. So here in our template now, uh, instead of the CD circle square being an element, we're using an SVG G element, which is just like a generic group, right? It doesn't really do anything unless you set like a transform on it or, or hide it or something. Um, it just groups other elements. So now this is a valid SVG element. This is just a sort of unknown attribute on that element. That, that should be fine, right? So yay, it, it works again. Uh, we've got our circle squares. Everyone in Chrome land is happy. Uh, in Firefox land, there's nothing. Um, and when you actually inspect this in Firefox's inspector, then you'll find uh, if you dig in, um, and here I'm going to select, I selected the circle in the inspector, and then in the console here, I'm going to inspect the namespace of that circle. And it's actually somehow Firefox got confused, and in the course of rendering, like Angular's rendering engine, taking that template and turning it into these things, it, it ended up as an HTML element. So now we have sort of this other problem where now our G element is an SVG element, but now the stuff inside is 
in Firefox at least, is this is not an SVG circle. It says circle, it's an HTML unknown element called circle. Um, and so, so that's sort of a, an, an issue with, with using this sort of approach. Um, so, so it works for simple cases, right? We, we got it working fine, right? Like we, we could have done cooler things with that. Um, and we could sort of stretch and do maybe a lot cooler things with that. Um, but like we'd probably always be dancing around these problems where like we're never quite sure if like our directives and our templates are gonna render correctly or like if Angular, they change like one little thing in the library, like maybe the rendering engine, which uses uh, inner HTML for a lot of this stuff, which is why like a lot of these things don't really work very well, um, including like transclusion. If you try to transclude like little parts of SVG and you're not like exactly in the right context or whatever, those things end up as HTML elements and, and things don't display correctly. Um, so it's an okay approach for, for simple things. Um, I might actually use it more now that I've experimented with, with it for these slides a little bit more. I was kind of like, eh, this is probably usable for some really simple cases. So uh, let's try like another approach. Instead of the Angular-centric approach, um, if you know D3 well, you know that it can do things. Um, it's actually really good at DOM manipulation. Um, so the first time I looked at D3, I was like kind of confused looking at a couple of the examples because I was like, this looks like jQuery almost. It's like, it's got this select function, which is kind of the first thing that you see and it's like selecting things. And uh, it's, it, I was like, I was like, I thought this would have like a graph thing that just drew stuff, but you know, it's, it's, it really is much lower level than that. It does have data binding, right? So you can, you can take sets of data and sort of, uh, I'll get a little bit more into that, but it has really powerful capabilities for this. Um, and sort of like if, if people are familiar with D3, like idiomatically, they want to control the DOM, right? So people that create visualizations with D3, you know, they don't want to use it on some controller and then just put their data somewhere. Like D3, like a lot of the power comes from grabbing hold of the DOM and doing cool stuff to it. So this is from uh, Mike Bostock, the, the creator of D3. This is an example he has up called Three Circles. Um, uh, maybe this isn't three circles actually, because I see four data points here. So, <laughs> uh, so here, so here, he has an SVG selection already. Um, he's going to select all the circles in there, which don't actually exist at this point. This is like one of those like head scratching moments when you first look at some of the tutorials. The circles don't actually exist yet, um, so it's selecting an empty selection, and then it does this data function, which basically takes the data you're trying to bind, compares it to that selection of circles. Uh, pretty much what happens is it realizes that none of those data points actually have circles yet. And then when you call enter, it gives you that selection of things that need to enter the DOM now, right? Um, so you can also call this exit function on there and it'll give you uh, sort of the things that were not in your data set anymore but actually were in the DOM, which is a really cool way of doing things. Um, but very confusing at first, especially with all the method chaining. You kind of like never know what's being returned from some function or, or where you are. Um, so here, so we get that enter selection and we append circles to that. So basically it, the enter selection contains four sort of phantom selections of nothing. Uh, we appended circles to that. So now we have four circles in the DOM. For each of those circles, it's going to bind, uh, well, it'll just statically set 60 to their, their center Y coordinate. And it'll use this function to determine what their X coordinate should be, right? So it's using their index, so the index zero through three here uh, times 100 plus 30, it'll set their X coordinate to that. And then it's taking the square root of, of these values for, for the radius. So very cool. Um, so D3 can do DOM stuff, and it, it does that data binding, right, which is, which is cool. Um, OK, cool. Um, so another thing that D3 does really well are transitions, uh, animations. So that selection right there, if I, if I already have stuff in the DOM, or I guess if I'm entering stuff into the DOM too, I can call this function in the middle of that sort of function chain there called transition. And then everything I do after that will sort of happen over time, which is really cool. So where I was setting the attributes there on that, on the radius, the center X coordinate and Y coordinate, if I would called transition before that with some sort of time, all of the attributes I set after that would have like been tweened to that value over some sort of time. So it does really cool stuff. You know, that sort of transition stuff, like if you try to do any of that D3 stuff and you were using just Angular's template binding to, to control these values, I, I don't even know how that would actually work, right? So how do we actually tie D3 into Angular then? So we, we pretty much decided that we want D3 to control the DOM of its visualizations. Um, 
And we know in Angular all the DOM manipulation is supposed to happen in directives, pretty much, right? So we'll, we'll put the D3 into the directive, right? So instead of tr trying to use it in a controller and just put things on the scope for the SVG to use, we're going to do everything in the directive. We're going to let the directive control its old, own DOM, right? So pretty much the directives now are not going to be really template-based. Um, they're pretty much just going to be using D3 to, to create, create their stuff. Um, so one way I found that's really great to actually implement the data binding is to uh, have those directives have some sort of attribute on them that allows them to get an expression from the template. Um, so rather than interpolating a value into the attribute, they're actually going to tell me like in string value, like on my model in this place is where this data is. And then my directive is actually going to register a watch on that specific thing. Um, instead of having all the data get you know, interpolated into string form into the attribute and then pulled out. Um, so yeah, one thing I sort of glossed over was the, the thing you're sort of missing with D3's data binding is that you know, if you saw that code, you might have realized that like, that's not going to update, right? Like, those circles were created, that function ran sort of statically, all that stuff got created with those x and y coordinates. But if that array of data had changed, like, there's no, because I'm not using Angular's interpolation, like, nothing's going to happen, right? Those circles are still going to stay there. Um, so pretty much you have to have, in your directive, you have to sort of take control of watching that data and then do the appropriate D3 magic to push that data into the visualization the right way. Um, so here's just, this is a little example of how I would do this um, on one of these directives, right? So you're just going to register a watch using the, so this is like in the link function or whatever of the directive. Um, you're going to take the data to draw attribute and watch it um, so that anytime any of that stuff changes, you're going to redraw, right? Here's a, a simple example. This is a scatter plot, right? This is all it takes to, to create a scatter plot. Um, here I actually am using a template because I didn't want to have anything else outside of this. Um, and actually, if you template in like an entire SVG, like the browser when you do enter HTML will recognize that that's an SVG in the SVG namespace and, and create that correctly. So that, that works fine. Um, so here we're in our link function, right? So our, our directive has been created and the scope uh, of it is being assigned to this link function, and it's, it's sort of, when this gets called, it's uh, ready to attach to the data. So what we're going to do is take the attribute scatter data, um, and we're just going to watch that expression. Whenever it changes, we're going to uh, use D3. This is a little bit of an ugly thing that I have together, but it basically just selects this SVG uh, using D3. So now I have that selection. I'm going to do that same thing where I try to select all the circles. Uh, the circles that aren't there but are in our data set will get appended on, and I just put a, you know, so their x coordinate and y coordinate um, will be used to, to set these coordinates, um, which means that my scatter data has to be sort of an array of objects with x and y coordinates. So here's my model. Um, I put uh, a series on here called test2 that's just uh, data points with x and y coordinates. Here's my template now. Um, so there's no SVG in the template, right? Now I just have this custom directive CV scatter. I have the scatter data attribute where I'm telling it on my scope that model.test2 is where you should look for the data, right? So the directive registers a watch on this and will change anytime that change. Um, and we get this beautiful scatter plot, which is beautiful. <laughs> um, cool. So uh, I talked about C3 a little bit in the design objective. So I pretty much haven't shown you any of the actual code from C3, and I'm, I'm not really going to in this because it's, it becomes a little bit more of a monster than these simple examples. Um, but I will show you kind of how uh, it is used um, in sort of simple examples. So first, I'm just going to create a line graph here that draws uh, an array of numbers. Um, so this could be a series of uh, the concurrent visitors on your site in, for one of our visualizations or whatever. Um, it probably would be constantly updating if this was an actual uh, chart beat thing. Um, so here's a bit of ugliness that exists in the current way that I'm doing things that I, I'm going to try to remove in a later iteration. But you have to create the D3 scales on your scope um, because sort of all the components that go into this graph uh, need to know how to translate the data values into like pixel values, right? Um, and the graph does control the range of the scales. So the graph knows when it's resized and it will control the range. So it basically knows what 
pixel values need to be output to actually be within the SVG, the size of the SVG. But you have to tell the domain of your data. Um, so here I'm just setting this so that the X domain is you know, between zero and whatever the top index is here, because I'm using the indexes and the arrays, my X. And the Y domain just looks for the max value of the series. So here's the actual template. Um, I create a graph here, right? I'm setting the width and height that will, and the padding, but those will determine the size of the SVG. There's a little bit of like magic in here where the padding will uh, sort of, it uses an SVG group element to sort of transform and shift the whole coordinate space so there's extra space around the edge um, where you can draw your axes and stuff. Um, uh, but so that like the scale functions don't have to scale values in, and take the padding into account, right? So it just it shifts the entire coordinate space and actually flips the Y so that the Y zero isn't at the top, it's at the bottom, which is how most of us draw graphs. Um, and then uh, this is sort of another annoyance right now is that I have these layers that uh, basically just help you stratify the different uh, components in your graph. Because SVG, unlike HTML, there's no Z index. So everything in, in SVG land has to be uh, in the right order in the DOM, right? Things that come later in the DOM, just like statically positioned things in HTML, things that come later in the DOM appear on top of other things. Um, but because D3 is creating everything programmatically for us and we're not really creating it here, uh, we create these layers and then when, uh, when these directives sort of create the, the parallel SVG structure um, through some magic, it, it, the layers sort of keep everything in the right Z order. Uh, so here's our line. Um, we're setting this line data attribute to the series I put on the model. Um, and then I have two axes, right? So these all have like sort of smart defaults. So uh, I just tell it orientation bottom, and it knows to use the x-axis because it's on the bottom. I mean the x-scale. Uh, orientation left, I tell it about how many ticks to, to use. Again, D, D3 is really smart about this. I tell it 10 ticks. It might actually draw eight if like, you know, those would be like the nicer values to display it. Um, and then I get a graph like this, and it's actually pretty cool. Um, and there's, you know, it actually listens for resizing and stuff, so it's kind of nice that you can just drop these things into your templates, bind them to model data, um, and then actually, running demo just to sort of show you how the so I basically just put, put a little randomness in so there's like an interval that's running and changing that data on the scope um, you can see that while this is running it's just every time the data changes on the scope I don't need to do anything um, the directives are just sort of detecting that and updating everything um, and you know this is a pretty simple directive but more complicated ones like uh, like scatter, you know, you might have the concept of like object identity, so different things in your data set would be matched up with specific dots on the graph and maybe they animate around or disappear or appear. We don't really have anything that complicated right now and we don't really have actually much need for that sort of complexity right now. Um, but that's possible. Um, so, let's get back to this. Um, so just sort of, let's evaluate this and sort of how we uh, how we did with our, with our original goals. Um, so we wanted to handle the common cases really easily, like line graphs. And, you know, I think that, that they're pretty easy right now. Right? That, that seemed pretty easy. You still have to do that sort of messy scale management. It might be nice if it sort of it inferred the scale of things from the data values that were set, but then that would be a little less efficient. It would have to constantly check your data to make sure it was still in the same bounds or whatever. Um, so some things we, you know, we make a little bit more difficult for some, some efficiency. Um, so, allowing for designers to style, that's actually super easy right now. Um, I don't think I really need to say much about that. It's, it's CSS, right? It's cool. Um, following Angular idioms. Um, so, we're able to do layout with templates, right? So, that's cool. Um, using data binding, yes, right? So, you don't interpolate your values right into the SVG, but you sort of put your model onto that attribute and it binds to it. Um, playing well with the built-in directives. Uh, currently that's a fail, uh, sort of because of the way that the templating stuff works and that these things sort of create all of their SVG elements actually outside of the original structure of, that those directives appear in. Um, putting like an ng show on one of those things will not hide and show the actual SVG elements um, that it creates. Um, but I have some thoughts for the, for the next version on how that, that maybe could work. 
Um, so we wanted to also allow for composability to sort of let us take smaller bits of stuff and build them up into more complex graphs. And I think that we pretty much succeeded with that. Um, you know, it's not super flexible. There have been certain types of graphs that I threw together quickly for a certain thing. And then when I've, we've looked at them later, I found that, yeah, I, I basically kind of hacked it for, for one purpose, um, which is okay for now. But, um, you know, we, we could do better with that. Uh, so next steps for this. Um, Iterate, right? So we were on C3. Now we're moving to C4. Things are going to get explosive here, you know? Yeah. Uh, and open source, right? <laughs> we, we really want to open source this stuff. It's still, like, kind of complicated. I'd like to simplify some of the stuff. I'd like to make kind of the whole, you know, it's, it's a little bit crazy how some of the stuff works right now. Um, but I think it has a lot of utility. Um, I'd like it to make it a little bit easier also for people who are really comfortable with D3 to sort of have a place, like a certain custom component that will call back one of their functions or something and just let them take the data and draw it, you know, in, inside some sort of context. So there are uh, things to be done, but uh, yeah, like Harry was talking about, we have stuff that we'd like to open source, so uh, that's in the pipeline. So that's pretty much it. Cool. Questions or anything? Uh, when you chose D3, did you evaluate any training libraries first, like MPD3 or anything like that? No, not really. <laughs> I can't. I can't say I really did. Um, yeah, I mean, we didn't really do a shootout like we did for the front end <laughs> frameworks. We were we were more yeah guns. Um, yeah, more. I mean, this sort of seemed like the thing to use. It had like a really active community and like lots of knowledge behind it, so um, it seemed like a safe bet. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, once I had learned how to use it, I was completely hooked on sort of the power of the framework. Yeah. So this might be kind of related. And first of all, great live demo. It was really oh, cool. Thanks. <laughs> um, but why did you choose SVG over HTML5? And does, does D3 work with HTML5? Uh, so you're talking about like HTML5 Canvas? Yeah. So Canvas, like we used to use Canvas. Um, and it has a number of disadvantages. Um, basically, I mean, Canvas is a pixel grid. So um, it doesn't, it, it's not stylable with CSS, right? You sort of draw things into this pixel grid. Um, and once they're drawn there, you kind of have to like come through and erase them and draw them again if you want to refresh them. Um, yeah, you can't style them with CSS. I think I said that already. Um, and it's also, I mean, it's, it, you can't, zoom in on it, like if people zoomed into their browsers or when I got this like Retina MacBook, it's just like, oh, this stuff looks kind of fuzzy, it's kind of annoying. Um, and I know you can like, you can double the pixel density and do sort of weird tricks. You can, you can put multiple canvases with transparent regions like on top of each other if you don't want to have to completely redraw like everything at the same time. Um, but our, our old charting system was based on uh, Canvas and SVG just seems like more like the future, right? Like everyone likes vector stuff. Um, I definitely do. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, it's easier to grab individual objects within the graph, right? All the sort of mouse hoverability and eventing systems, stuff like that. Um, you can transform, I mean, SVG has a, a whole lot of power that I didn't even sort of discuss here. Um, and I, I can't remember if SVG, I think SVG embedded in HTML is like part of the HTML5 spec. Like, I don't really know my specs that well, but, so. Uh, anyone else? Did you ever resolve the issue with the, the Firefox? Um, uh, yeah, so that ends up not really being an issue the way that we're doing it. Um, because we're not like using like little piecemeal templates of bits of SVG, um, it, it never becomes an issue. That was basically an issue with Angular's rendering engine, um, the way that it uh, or compiler, I think it's the compile service that actually does this, that it that, that takes the, the templates and tries to convert them into DOM elements. Um, yeah, it seems to work a little bit differently in, in those two browsers. Uh, I, I found like a bunch of discussions online, uh, not a bunch, but a couple in like the Google groups by the actual Angular maintainers with different people asking them to support different things. Um, and basically it seems like it's not really even possible to support all of the like the things that you could do with it. Because uh, SVG elements are not even always like unambiguously SVG. Like if I had a template that just had a, a, an A element in it, like an anchor tag, um, there's actually an SVG element called A also. 
Um, and you, you wouldn't have any way of knowing, like, if you just had that little bit of template, like, whether you should create an SVG anchor element or an HTML anchor element. So um, one of the things I was thinking is maybe you could uh, grab your, uh, or do a get request of your SVG separately, perhaps through Ajax, and set the MIME type to be uh, what it, uh, text slash SVG or application slash SVG. Uh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, all this stuff, this SVG is all being generated within the browser um, on the local data. So, I think, you know, to sort of go to the server to do things like that are probably not something that we would consider. Yeah. Could you go back to your template for your graph? Yeah. Lost my little. Template for the line. for the line graph near the end here. Yeah, uh, well, we have all your custom Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so I was just curious. All these custom directives, mm -hmm. they all they're, they're all just Angular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, then a little confused. So, do they all? But but this template itself is referenced. Uh, no, this is actually just directly in the HTML file, right? So in the HTML file, basically the body tag is right here, uh, and then there's just a div with this controller here. Um, so what happens, I, I mean, I mentioned there is like some sort of magic about the SVG actually being generated somewhere else. So the SVG that all these things generate is not actually in this structure. Um, what happens is everything that's inside this C3 graph gets transcluded into like an invisible div somewhere else. And then basically all this stuff just exists to provide all the scoping and uh, stuff that you want to sort of communicate from, from your original scope, the data down to all these components, right? And then all these things talk to pretty much this controller to figure out where the SVG is, right? So these things get transcluded into like an invisible DOM. Then this thing creates an SVG over here. And then all these things, when they do their thing, they're actually drawing into an SVG that's over here. Um, okay, so like c 3 rat will make one SG, yeah, exactly. Um, and then everything else just adds, con contributes like SVG elements. Yeah, so it, it adds one SVG. Each of these layers creates a different uh, G element within okay. that SVG to sort of keep things in the right Z index order. And then each of these components has sort of a reference to its layer, um, to that G element, and it draws inside there. So like the C3 dash graph dash, dash layer will have a template that's just like the G element. Uh, so actually, it doesn't have a template. Um, so none of these things really have templates except the C3 graph. Um, so these things, like D3 actually just creates that element, right? Um, so this C3 graph layer actually in the, the pre-link function gets a reference to the SVG from the graph and just one time creates one SVG object, uh, sorry, one, one G element. Okay within there, right? And then it holds on to a reference to that. And then any of its child elements are able to get from their parent controller, right? We use the, the require to sort of communicate between controllers. So you like select the SVG and you just like append G elements. Yeah, so, so each of these is able to basically tell the graph that it wants to add a layer. I, actually, I think maybe the graph even adds it. It's, yeah, the way that some of this stuff works is not like, um, I, I kind of did all this stuff in like one quick sprint to get like a couple graphs ready for a new product and then like over time like I've tried to refine some of it but um, yeah I haven't actually looked at that code that much but yeah this thing creates one SVG each layer basically tells one of the controllers to within that SVG create another G element uh, each of the actual like visible components has a reference to its layer G elements and is able to draw its own stuff in there I was also wondering about where you are So uh, I think like, uh, like Harry was saying, you know, our move to Angular was pretty nice because we were like, we basically decided to switch like when we were only, well, we were actually kind of already rewriting one of our products, but we decided it was important enough to switch frameworks that we just like scrapped all of that actually and started fresh. Um, so our publishing product was completely rewritten in Angular um, last year. Um, and this was originally written to, to create the graphs in that. And I can show. Um, so, so like this graph here, um, it's actually my computer for 
I think I lost the network. Yeah. That kind of sucks. Yeah, this demo sucks. Um, yeah, there we go. So this graph is was kind of like the first thing that it was written for. So this has lines. Uh, it has I don't know if you can put contrast on this is kind of bad. There's like this historical line underneath the gray line. There's this stream graph that shows traffic from different traffic sources over the course of the day. Um, there's binding to this like uh, tooltip thing. There are events that are drawn on the same sort of scale that these are SVG circles that then have data that shows up in an, in an HTML pop up. Um, or there are tweets also that you can bring up in a little pop up. So, uh, yeah, so all, all that stuff was written pretty much for this graph initially, which also had like a bar graph originally, and then the designer sort of decided the stream graph thing was better. Um, yeah, so I don't know actually what I was talking about when I started going into that. Um, do, do you still have Canvas? So we do. So if you look at uh, our uh, proprietary information. Uh, let's see who our clients are. <laughs> um, so here, this is actually still Canvas. Um, so th this is our like normal Chartbeat product, not the publishing product. This hasn't been, none of this stuff has been Angularized yet. This is still Closure. Yeah, this is still this is still based on Google Closure. Um, you know, it's like I can actually do the whole like zoom in, and then you start seeing these mm -hmm. things get pixelated. You see the dials start getting pixelated, but uh, even the icons and stuff, which we're now doing in SVG also. Mm -hmm. um, So how, do you have, how, many, uh, how many developers do you guys have per team? Like how do you guys organize? Uh, so yeah, I mean, Harry talked about that a little bit too. We're sort of split up into like product vertical teams right now. Right. Um, people do shift from product to product, like in different uh, uh, in different cycles, right? So we work in these six week cycles, and then after the hack week, we we might reconfigure a little bit. But uh, so there's. Yeah, maybe like two front end devs per project. Like we've had as little as one for certain things. Like we've been stretched thin a couple times. Um, and then uh, we have you know data scientists and back end engineers, uh, product people, vertical designers, marketers, all in these same sort of vertical teams. Okay, so um, can I can I just I know because we have two more presenters. Uh, one. Well, actually. One more. Okay. I yeah, would suggest we come to the rest of the Q and A after, especially since we're getting into more yeah. general. Unless there's anything else that needs clarification, just because we're at eight thirty, so make sure. Yeah. Did they move in? Yeah. Is that okay? Good call. All right. Yeah, or you can grab me after. I'm yeah, sure. Cool. Thanks, dude.